I would like to welcome you here to the, today's session on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. I would like to welcome and say hello to all of you also on behalf of my partner of today's session, the Media and Law Studies Association from Turkey. Who are we, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation? We are based in Berlin, but we are also liberal political think tanks with 50 offices worldwide. We are working in the areas of economic development, innovation and digitalization, and especially human rights. We support worldwide NGOs in their important work in order to defend human rights and especially the freedom of expression, such as the Media and Law Studies Association in Turkey. Freedom of expression includes freedom from censorship. And you will learn more about our session's topic today, how online freedom is being restricted, especially by new social media laws in Russia and in Turkey. Our session will be moderated by Barış Altintas and Barış, the floor is yours. I will hand over to you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thank you for, for this introduction and your uh, welcoming re uh, remarks. Yes, my name is Barış. I'm, uh, I work at the Media and Law Studies Association in Turkey, and today I will be moderating this discussion. And we will be discussing the increasing desire of uh, Turkey and Russia to control social media. Uh, it's, this is uh, interesting because uh, uh, people who follow both countries notice that things kind of happen around the same time. You know, when, and this is not only social media, whatever the topic is, you know, if, uh, uh, if uh, it's anti-LGBT something, then one, uh, the, the rest one will follow the next week or the next month. So this is very interesting. And of course, this is a general trend. And, uh, but before we start, we have a very short poll on uh, how the audience uses social media and how important it is. So if you could uh, quickly answer the questions, um, just to, you know, uh, uh, remind us all of the fact that it is very important for, for any person not just for journalists or activists. And uh, just to, you know, um, just to really understand what restricting social media might mean for the average person. And um, I can't see your answers yet, but I can say my, uh, I'm just gonna share my usage overview. So uh, <laughs> from uh, my phone. So today, and today it's, it's only 2 p.m. 2 p.m. here in Turkey. I've used uh, my phone for five hours and I've used uh, uh, WhatsApp and Reddit, so social media uh, for about two and a half hours of that. So that's not very healthy, uh, but um, but the, um, I can't see the questions that I'm going to be. Um, uh, so this, you know, comparing to the global average, uh, I don't have any social media statistics on Turkey and Russia, but uh, according to the Digital 2020 survey. And Russians and, and Turkish people use uh, the internet overall uh, for seven hours a day. Uh, however, uh, again, not knowing the social media uh, statistics. Oh, wait a minute. Is the screen your your responses also came in? But I can't see them. Um, but however, uh, I'll get back to your results soon. Uh, uh, some. Uh, Statistics from the TÜİK, the Turkish Statistics Agency, uh, say that the average person in Turkey still spends about six hours watching TV, and they also say that you know they get most of their uh, news from TV, uh, from television. And in the case of Russia, you know where there's uh, again this uh, ongoing hostility against these big tech companies, especially from uh, from international uh, agencies. The the the most uh, widely used um, statistics. Uh, the most widely used social media are actually Kontakte and Adna Klasniki, which are uh, which are not international companies. So uh, there's uh, it's I think I find this interesting because you know Russia and Turkey have been very concerned about what people say on social media, how they use it, but it's it's not very certain that uh, people uh, actually you know um, use them to I don't know. Um, overthrow the governments or something. So it's very interesting. And also, you know, both of these countries have uh, uh, many prisoners in uh, jail. Two Kabot countries have uh, jailed their opposition leaders, despite very uh, strong European Court of Human Rights uh, decisions in the case of Selatin Demirtas and Alexei Navalny, for example. And the right to protest is almost non-existent. And uh, do they, everything is pretty much under control. 
you know, looking from, from this view, but why are they uh, still regulating uh, social media this much? Because, you know, uh, access uh, bans and blockings are common. Do they really need this? So today we will be answering uh, these questions. Uh, uh, we'll be trying to answer these questions uh, together. And uh, we will also be looking forward for your input because we might not have the answers. And uh, so today with us, uh, Adrian Shafas from Freedom House will be joining us. He's director for technology and democracy, and uh, Freedom House is the uh, uh, you know one of the leading producers of analysis and data uh, on internet freedoms uh, with their annual surveys, uh, Freedom on the Net, uh, for us. And uh, we ha also have Andrei Saldatov and um, Irina Baragan, who are uh, Russian investigative journalists, and they have. Uh, they're, uh, I don't even know if they need introduction, but their journalism has focused on uh, Russian security services. And they're, uh, the, I think they will be sharing this, uh, a link with you that they, um, a, an article recently they published for the Friedrich Norman Foundation, but they, uh, they co-authored a book in 2010 uh, called The New Mobility, uh, focusing on these issues, which, was a, which is a very good read as well. But uh, so they have a lot of publications and, and uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Zelal uh, Telin Doan. And Zelal is, a, is actually a lawyer working uh, at MLSA. And she specifically works on cases of human rights and freedom of the press and freedom of the speech. And most of her clients are uh, journalists who are actually affected by these uh, bans and prisons, uh, uh, imprisonments and whatnot. So first, I would like to uh, start with Irina. And if uh, Irina, so what is the situation with the uh, social media regulation in Russia right now? How how are they approaching, you know, big tech and companies? What is what are their concerns? Uh, you know, in Russia, uh, there are so much legislation, uh, restrictive legislation on social media and on traditional media was adopted for the last few years. That even for me a person who are involved in all these issues, even for me, it's very difficult to understand what is allowed and what is prohibited. Because uh, everything, uh, literally everything that concerns politics or important matters can be considered as, uh, which you posted on your social media, as a journalist or as an individual can be considered extremism or disrespect to the authorities or calls for uh, participation uh, or calls for participation in public disorders with in reality means uh, peaceful demonstrations and so far and so on. So uh, to operate on your social media as journalists and uh, as an individuals, it's very, very difficult today. The latest you asked me about the latest developments, the latest developments uh, in this direction, I can, I can, I can, I can, uh, give you the full picture of all the legislations of Russia because it takes me like five hours, maybe 10 hour, hours, but the latest development was the social media self-regulation law. This law obliged the social media to monitor pro preemptively the whole contact on say Facebook, Twitter, Adnaklasniki, and to shut down uh, all the content that can be considered as illegal. I told that illegal content, according to the Russian, Russian legislation, may be anything from uh, from real, really illegal content like uh, information on drugs or child porn, porno, to uh, any kind of critic of to the authorities and uh, any kind of uh, any information about peaceful demonstrations uh, or even even just. Even just some kind of radical opinion on any issue. The my favorite, the my favorite examples of uh, crazy uh, of crazy implementation of all this law uh, happened a few years ago. A man was sent to prison for posting on his on his Facebook uh, a picture of of toothpaste with kept this caption: "Squeeze Russia out of yourself." We Russians, we understand the, uh, the long, uh, which is, uh, this is a metaphor and this is a reference to Anton Chekhov's, Anton Chekhov's uh, quotation. But really, what does it mean? It means nothing. Squeeze Russia out of yourself. It's, I don't know, it's satire. It's not harmful to the authorities, to anybody, but a man was sent to prison for a few years for this. 
Okay. Well, yes, this, is, this also sounds very similar to Turkey. I'm sure Zelay will be sharing uh, similar examples uh, that are absurd. But uh, uh, on the other side of this coin is uh, surveillance. So this is where I want to go to uh, Andre. Uh, so what is this? Uh, uh, how are, uh, you know, Russian, um, how is the Russian state uh, doing on surveillance? Are they really intercepting communications? Who are they listening to? What do they want to find out? Uh, well, it's getting more and more uh, effective uh, with the years. So uh, we have in place a very intrusive system of uh, targeted surveillance, uh, which is basically a system of backdoors. Uh, every Russian internet service provider uh, is required by law uh, to have a backdoor uh, and to, uh, to give access to uh, Russian security services to provide uh, access to uh, premises and uh, cables and uh, databases completely unrestricted and uh, with no way to control what is actually accessed and what kind of information intercepted. But right now, we, I would say that the Russian authorities just uh, put this on, on the next level because we have a new system of uh, the so-called sovereign uh, internet, uh, which is a combination of two things. It's, uh, it's a surveillance but it's also censorship. And it's also uh, gives an authority, a tool uh, to uh, redirect the traffic uh, from a particular region or to a particular region. And it works like that. If you have some problems uh, in say Siberia or uh, in the Far East, uh, and you do not want this uh, protest to spread to other regions, uh, you can cut off uh, the internet connection to this region or out of this region. Uh, and it's extremely, uh, extremely effective. Uh, the other option we have for this system is that uh, the devices uh, which, <coughs> excuse me, were uh, introduced and installed on the premises of all internet service providers in the country, uh, help the authorities to put more pressure on global platforms like Twitter and this spring, we saw how Twitter was uh, slowing down uh, in the country thanks to this system, because we uh, they started using these devices. And it's uh, basically it's deep packet inspection, and and this technology uh, provides you with the opportunity to uh, to redirect the traffic or to take down some uh, some particular uh, traffics. But it also uh, helps you to look into the traffic and to identify uh, particular ways, uh, particular kinds of traffics or particular messages. And uh, so the Russian system of surveillance is getting better and better. And in combination with all the restriction uh, legislation we already have in place, uh, to be honest, uh, the picture is looking quite bleak right now. Uh, and the, the other problem is uh, the last one, which I wanted to mention that uh, the, Russia is one of the very few countries where local uh, social media are much more popular than global media. Uh, so we still have Kontakte and Adnaklasniki really popular. So of course we have Facebook and Twitter and Google and they're still uh, accessible for users, but they are not that popular. And the problem with local social media that they are cooperating uh, very closely with Russian security services. And uh, with many cases, actually with 98% of the cases of persecution of the users of social media, uh, we have the cases of the users of the Russian social media. Okay, this is an interesting uh, uh, statistic, but I have a, a, a question uh, which might not be very uh, informed and educated, but about these uh, deep package ins inspections and uh, you know, providers, service providers using them. Isn't this very costly as an infrastructure? How are how are the local companies, uh, you know, dealing with this? Or uh, because no, because you said it got effective. Uh, does it should you know? Is it uh, financially doable? Or how are these uh, the companies? What what stage are they at? Yeah, it's it's actually it's a very good question because for many many years, and it started uh, literally in the nineteen nineties. Uh, the FSB, the Russian Security Service, uh, tried to and actually was quite successful at. Uh, putting pressure on the ISPs to, to install these devices and uh, SORM devices back then, uh, surveillance devices, and to force the companies pay for these devices. 
and that actually caused a lot of uh, uh, noise from uh, from Russian telecommunication industry because we didn't want to pay for these devices because these devices should be uh, constantly updated. But recently, the Kremlin well, learned his lesson. So for the new system of the sovereign internet, uh, the government said that we are ready to pay and we are ready to send these devices and to deliver these devices to you. And that would give us uh, the leverage. So you, you have no way to say no, but it also gives uh, the government the opportunity to control these devices remotely uh, from Moscow. So very first time in our history, we have literally the center specifically built in Moscow where you can uh, control the traffic all over the country and remotely play with this traffic. So if you have some problems in Siberia, some problem in, in central Russia, uh, we have some protests, or maybe even a natural catastrophe, and you want to limit access of people outside of this region to this kind of information, you now have this option and you can do that remotely. Yeah. Well, that, that is very alarming. And it sounds very much uh, something like Turkey would do. You know, we'll pay for you for your, and actually the funny thing is that when the government says, we will pay for you. We're actually paying, you know, as taxpayers, from our own pockets for this uh, censorship. And uh, that—that's uh, again one of those points where, uh, uh, where I can under—I can't relate to this, but I can completely understand uh, uh, this this approach uh, that the government has. And this is a, uh, something that might also come up in Turkey, where I think uh, this uh, surveillance and interception part is not very effective. Uh, I can say, you know, um, based on the indictments we've seen after the coup attempt, uh, there weren't many, you know, intercepted emails or whatever. Every digital document pretty much in thousands of thousands of pages of indictment we've seen. Uh, uh, any uh, information uh, uh, that was uh, exchanged online would be basically uh, seized uh, by seizing a physical device. So I think Turkey doesn't have this infrastructure or, uh, but if uh, they get this idea, uh, they'll find ways. So uh, so this, uh, I want to turn to Zelal here. So what is going on in Turkey? What is this uh, social media law? Because they, uh, reg uh, you know, on the regular, they've been uh, blocking uh, news reports, especially about Erdogan's family. And like what, like Irina said, it's very, not very clear what is uh, allowed and what is not. You know, there's uh, these, it's very hard to navigate, especially for journalists and activists. What is the situation? Mm -hmm. um, as we know, Turkey is going through a time frequent restrictions of the right to freedom of expression and the press. And actually, uh, I was also thinking where to start uh, to talk about and i think it would be uh, would be good to mention uh, 2016 and say a few words about the new uh, internet law because uh, in the aftermath of the coup attempt of uh, 15 july uh, at, le at least almost uh, 200 media outlets have been closed down uh, approximately approximately over uh, 2,000 journalists lost their jobs and dozens of journalists have been arrested and the government control on printed media outlets increased to uh, 95%. And uh, given the continuously intensifying pressure on the offline and online media outlets, independent journalists have started to come with their news reports to their audience main, mainly on the internet using social media platforms instead of traditional press organizations. In parallel, citizens seeking channels for independent news and for free expression like this turn to social media. Uh, among them are many social groups and human rights activists that are unable to make their voices heard and uh, government controlled uh, mainstream media. And then social media has turned into a public space, public space in Turkey where many social segments meet. Different voices can be heard and journalists can share news, their news. Now, um, at the moment, Facebook has 37 million users in Turkey and uh, Twitter 13.6 uh, million. 
In an attempt to catch up with this new digital reality, the government has started to also target the internet, the sole remaining channel to share different options. In addition to trials of thousands of people for their posts on the internet, access ban to websites and content removals, uh, a new law tightening to the use of social media platforms has been adopted in July. Uh, in July 2020. This new uh, regulation known as um, social media law entered into force uh, last October. It creates the category of social network providers for real or uh, legal entities uh, allowing users to create, view or share online contact uh, such as text, visual contact, uh, voice recordings and locations online for social interaction purposes. And uh, consequently, it also introduces a range of obligations for online platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, which fall under uh, the category of social network providers. And in line with the new legislation, all foreign-based social network providers with more than 1 million daily accesses from Turkey are obliged to appoint a legal representative in the country. Moreover, um, the, the social network providers uh, are required to store the data of their users from Turkey inside the country. Uh, the local storage of personal data results in the possibility of judicial and administrative authorities to recase this data. So, like, can also I ask a question here about hmm. this? Uh, so, when, so these uh, social media companies in Turkey, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, they have all said, yes, we're coming to Turkey, right? So yes. This, uh, so this is a, how do uh, lawyers see this? Uh, for, um, so when you just said that, you know, they have to share local data uh, of people, but is Turkey will be Turkey be able to um, follow this? Uh, on, for example, <laughs> in the case of uh, people uh, using VPN. And it... Secondly, uh, one other thing is that, for example, if for example, what in Russia, right? Twitter didn't take off content, or maybe they did, but they weren't slow, and so they uh, used these uh, uh, deep uh, inspection packages and slowed them down, and there are things. But uh, for example, if uh, Turkey wants to wants an account to be uh, shut down. How is that legally possible? I mean, if the person is Turkey or, uh, or in, in France, for example, we have a lot of exiled journalists in Germany there. So how, uh, and they say, oh, shut this account uh, down. So mm -hmm. remove it from the platform. Can they do it physically? What is, I mean, legally, that's what the law says, but is it, is it possible? Uh, with any regulation, yes, it's possible. And, uh, for example, the government claims to prote protect citizens with uh, these days laws, uh, the personal data, citizens' personal data, uh, for combating uh, cybercrime and hate speech with uh, this new law. Uh, and the most important thing, uh, when the draft law was discussed in the parliament, uh, the government uh, said that there are such regulations in many European countries, especially in Germany. But I think the, in, uh, the enthusiasm of uh, adapting such regulations in Europe to Turkey leads to more uh, oppressive uh, results here. Uh, actually, from the submission of the draft law, as you know, uh, into Parliament in July 2020. Uh, until today, uh, this social media law um, has remained strongly contested. NGOs, journalists, and activists working to protect the needs uh, and freedom of expression. Uh, called repeatedly for social media companies not to comply with the law. Uh, and they were calling it, and they are still calling it the censorship law. 
and they drew attention to its role of taking censorship to a more suffocative level and of creating potentially dangerous consequences for citizens by uh, completely removing the data security. Okay, and, um, security is then, can I just right here, I want to go to Adrian. And uh, so uh, this is an interesting point, uh, you know, the, the compliance of these uh, social media companies. Unfortunately, none of their representatives are here with us. But Adrian, do you, uh, uh, does uh, Freedom uh, House Research find that, uh, you know, stricter or authoritarian countries are, uh, end up uh, passing increasingly similar laws to control social media? And secondly, how are um, the, the big tech companies approaching this? Are they, uh, are they saying, okay, at some point, like they did in Turkey, uh, you know, how, how, how are things uh, globally? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, we are seeing common approaches among authoritarian governments around regulating social media. I think the aspects of that playbook are many things that Andre, um, Irina and Zilal have mentioned around, you know, data localization, um, anti-encryption measures, uh, changing intermediary liability laws or forcing companies to quickly remove um, what they call illegal content, um, establish, you know, appointing a local representative. So I think these are all parts of that playbook that we're seeing spread around the world. This is often combined with an, uh, the, the tactic of blocking or throttling social media platforms as a means to coerce these companies to do the government's bidding. So it's essentially a governments are doing all that they can to, I think, increase their leverage over social media companies so that they can force them into complying with demands for censorship or to hand over data. And they do that by threatening to just prevent access at all to the country, which you know, would have disastrous economic consequences, but also for their users. Uh, would have disastrous consequences for, you know, access to information, media freedom, and free expression. I should say, you know, you mentioned how are companies dealing with it. And I think, you know, I don't have a, a secret window into their own processes, but I do know that um, in, in 2020, for example, Facebook agreed to remove so-called anti-government uh, or anti-state content in Vietnam. Um, that's a country where internet freedom has declined in recent years. Um, you've had uh, state-owned telecoms that were constantly threatening to uh, throttle access to Facebook. And so Facebook essentially, it appears, had a choice of essentially remaining accessible in the country or complying with some form of censorship from the government. I should also mention, though, that these measures in this playbook is uh, not only being introduced in countries in our methodology that are ranked as not free, they're also there in partly free and also free countries. And I think the, the big example from um, the past year or so is in India, where both democracy and internet freedom have declined in recent years. And there the government has just implemented something called the information technology rules of 2021, which, you know, no surprise, forces tech companies to appoint a representative and allows the government to restrict access to um, platforms that do not comply with takedown requests. There's also this, this second component of, of the law in India, which mimics um, something that we had seen from many of the Five Eyes governments, um, which are you know, the experts in intelligence and surveillance. And that is in the Indian law compels tech platforms to retain um, user data for 180 days, even after users' accounts have been deleted, and importantly, to identify the so-called first originator of encrypted messages. And that's something that WhatsApp is actually challenging in court. So this is an example where in a more, let's say, partly free country where rule of law exists, the judiciary does have a little bit more independence. We are seeing companies use the legal system in order to challenge this whenever possible. Um, but yes, this is something that we're seeing, I think, spread to all countries along the democratic spectrum in different ways. Yeah, this is very interesting. And I uh, just a quick question, one question about India. Uh, do you, uh, you know, given the judicial structures of the country, does uh, WhatsApp's lawsuit have any chance really? This is, 
or is, I mean, are the judges going to look at this technically? Oh, if they do this, they can't do an encryption anymore, so it can't be done. Or are they going to be, um, or in for any of these other countries, can uh, uh, are, what remains as legal recourse? Is it uh, is it there actually? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have seen some um, some positive successes around you know strategic litigation. Um, in India, the judiciary has been, you know, has a mixed record. I think that there was a, um, a very landmark, uh, a landmark case a few years ago where they outlined the, or they defined the right to privacy in India. Um, and similarly, there has been quite a bit of tension between the judiciary and the government in the country. The question is whether the government cares, um, whether the, you know, whether the, uh, the administration there is willing essentially to um, surpass checks and balances and, you know, the constitution in order to force the judiciary to not comply with the judiciary. That's something that we've seen around with the Adhar biometric ID system in the country. But I think more broadly, we have seen some good examples from Brazil, from Indonesia, and even in Sudan where, and in Pakistan, where we have seen the courts being used in a way to, um, to, let's say, push forward to reverse a negative law or to um, enshrine human rights online? Well, I think in the case of Turkey and Russia, this, <laughs> this is a bit different. Sometimes you get good court decisions, but most of the time uh, they are very integrated to the, uh, to the state. I'm, this is not about uh, the, uh, of course, independence of judiciary, uh, but uh, speaking for these two countries, I think it is a major uh, problem. Uh, enabling uh, these governments to continue because the courts rarely surprise us, unfortunately, uh, because how the system is ingrained. But uh, but the, it's good to know that there's hope in other countries. And uh, so um, I want to go back to Irina and Andre with a question. And but also I want to open the floor to any questions or comments. Of uh, so we will be now seeking answers to maybe what can be done. And uh, as I said initially, we don't all have the answers at all times. So if you have any questions or any comments, if you want to share experiences, uh, please do. You, uh, they don't necessarily uh, need to be questions. We are very open to ideas. Uh, but uh, uh, because more on the technical side. Uh, so Irina and Andre, what can uh, journalists or users, is there anything that can be done as a user? I know maybe include yourself technically to, to uh, um, I know, work around these um, uh, surveillance or uh, or uh, censorship, or uh, when it gets to a level of where you know they're using uh, good software, good technology, like where Russia is going, where China, are we? We don't have any chances. Or what is there anything that can be done? Um, the problem has the problem you described has two parts. The first part is uh, it is about uh, public speech. If you want to if you want to say something publicly, if you want to publish something as journalist, you can't. Uh, you can be anonymous. So it means all technical solutions are uh, useless for you because you want to be listened to by many, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, by a lot of people. Uh, the second part of the problem is when you wanted to communicate secret, secretly with your sources as a journalist and you want to avoid uh, surveillance. This problem uh, so far in Russia, you can solve this problem, you, this problem using uh, Using a lot of uh, a lot of technical tools like uh, secret uh, like uh, like uh, messengers uh, as Signal and even WhatsApp is quite is, is quite safe in Russia and also you can use a lot of you can use uh, decrypt, uh, encryption and uh, many other uh, technical tools to avoid surveillance but the authorities because the Russia is a country of total surveillance and uh, techniques that authorities use are extremely advanced. Uh, sometimes it's difficult because your devices can be infected by virus and you can avoid surveillance. You can be physically stopped with your devices at the borders or at the street by the police and your devices can be deprived of, stripped of you and searched by the authorities, which is also, you can, of course you can, uh, encrypted part of your information but when you're under physical uh, under physical pressure uh, of, of the police uh, you can't you can't save your 
uh, your passwords you have to you have to give your passwords them and so but it depends it depends you can't you can't communicate with your sources anonymously still and yeah, maybe taking it offline a little bit i don't know where, where the you know also the picture that adrian drew is where the world is of course the internet is always evolving you know the uh, users or you know technical people find new ways governments find new ways and you know the use of signal has, has also increased in turkey and but i uh, in general i'm not sure if the general uh, journalist population is very um, knowledgeable about uh, these not only knowledgeable but there's also user um, habits that are hard to change uh, so maybe part of it is for us to basically uh, be more smart about our internet usage and there are also some comments that i just want to go through so uh so Katitsu rodriguez wrote our legal analysis of turkish internet regulation uh, from eff if uh, if everybody can see this link and thank you for sharing this and uh and Ena Omerovic uh, also shared uh, information. I want to point out that next week we will release an episode on digital censorship and social media content removal in Turkey and, uh, and what individuals can do in response to it, which is, yes, the answer uh, that we're uh, looking for. Well, thank you for this. And also the link is uh, uh, in the chat. I don't know if everybody can see that. Uh, I think so. And uh, so this, yes, these are questions for, uh, for, uh, the, for everyone. But uh, in, in terms of uh, your experience, Delal, would you say that our journalists in, or lawyers also who have come under attack are more aware of these, uh, I don't know, ways to, to protect themselves? And secondly, how can you protect yourself on social media legally? Or is there any chance of this at all? And, and you, uh, you ask this question to whom? I asked it to Zilla. So, think... so sorry, yes. Uh, actually, I think that uh, the freedom of expression and the internet freedoms are in danger for many years in Turkey. And um, as I said, or as I saw, um, in the eyes of the Turkish uh, civil society organizations, including MLSA, and um, the, for example, the new social media law is an attempt on the part of the government to monopolize the information flow online and to expose citizens to stri stricter surveillance and control. Actually, what I point out that, um, in fact, the pressure on social media in Turkey is increasing in cases of emergency. And what I think and what we see, especially at the time of uh, military operations or cor corruption investigations or uh, any prosecution or anything else yes, about the uh, president's family, uh, in this situation, the government blocks access to the internet and also many social media users are under investigations and prosecutions for making terrorist propaganda or insulting. And uh, yes, we are trying to protect and promoting uh, the internet freedoms and freedom of expression of citizens or everyone. And uh, in this context, we as MLSA object to these uh, access ban decisions. And if necessary, we apply also to the Constitutional Court and Strasbourg Court to combat uh, the censorship. And I think that uh, social media is one of the most uh, indispensable uh, channels of our age. And therefore, I would like to point out that international solid solidarity and struggle against all kinds of censorship are important. And uh, it's really bad to say that, but I think the government uh, will continue to uh, block the internet access and uh, uh, will continue to pressure to the citizens and their freedom of expression and freedom of press. And so we have to try to combat against that. 
So it's very depressing, but we have a very good question. And then, uh, I, I, yes, we partially touched upon this. Uh, so Tatiana Margolin is asking, is there any potential in working with platforms? Uh, you all touched on this, but can you address this more explicitly? This is a, a good question. And also if the audience has any views on this, but are platforms friends, foes, is, can we work with them? What are your thoughts on, uh, on this? Andre, Irina, Andre, uh, Adrian, if you have anything to uh, add, this is very interesting. This. Finally, it's something something more optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, uh, even Facebook, uh, I should admit, is uh, is actually is uh, responding to Russian uh, journalists' uh, request. And uh, if something is taken down because, uh, say, trolls report to you uh, falsely that you posted something like a a uh, naked picture, and it's not the case, um, but some algorithms of Facebook uh, take your page down. Well, usually Facebook responds to this request and, uh, and, and get back your, uh, uh, get back your uh, access to your page and uh, it's, it's getting better. Uh, with WhatsApp, you have the same story that actually uh, Facebook is, uh, is responsive. Uh, even with Twitter, uh, I would say that the picture is a bit more uh, optimistic than the Russian authorities try to, uh, to present it. Uh, so the Russian authorities claimed victory, saying like uh, Twitter removed and took down all uh, the messages, all the posts they wanted to remove. But actually, it's about the protest which uh, took place in February. And uh, well, it's of course, it's still the case, but I think uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that it's not going on live. So it's not going on right now. Like when you have protests going on and uh, uh, the Russian authorities would love to have uh, a direct line of communication to Twitter to ask them to take down uh, messages to the protests which are going on right now. But it's not what is going on. Uh, with Google also, yes, we have uh, YouTube uh, going under Im immense pressure. And right now we have courts uh, fining Google for more and more and more. And it's uh, at the end of the year, we expect Google to be funded for $1 billion, maybe more. And all in order to force it into cooperation. But so far, it's not very successful. And also we need to remember two things, that usually this pressure on global platforms goes in two direction. One direction is taking down messages and posts. And in this well, uh, area, it's uh, slightly, well, I would say successful. But the second option, uh, the second direction uh, the Russian uh, government wants to pursue is to force global platforms to share personal data um, and communications uh, uh, uh, which are private. And uh, uh, so far, I would say it very carefully, uh, global platforms resist uh, this pressure. So I never had of any case uh, prosecuted by the authorities where you have like uh, WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger data or Twitter data uh, it, well, presented to the court, uh, which is a good sign. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, I agree with this, but also uh, just taking on from this, Adrian, is I asked you this question earlier. Uh, so there's some positivity and they are uh, not very openly willing to share uh, user data. That's why they're pressured, uh, like Andre very uh, nicely uh, uh, summarized. But there's also been a criticism of platforms. Again, of course, we don't know, they're not here, but of, uh, for example, the, uh, the protests in Palestine or the, the farmer protests in India, in Colombia, other parts. So there's also that aspect where they seem to be, um, I don't know, seem to be uh, basically knowingly or unknowingly, this is not an indictment of any, any platform. Uh, this can also work against, uh, against us as well. So uh, uh, how does that work in other countries, Adrian, with the platforms? Does, uh, with the, yes, they have a positive role, but do, all, do they also have a negative role, especially for countries like uh, Turkey and Russia, or of course there are no other countries like Turkey and Russia, but, <laughs> but who are, as a, who are as a, you know, who are in that stricter authoritarian direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a similar trend. Um, I think, you know, you were talking about um, the events that happened, you know, in, in Palestine um, recently and the, the um, 
from all that we can say from the outside, what appears to be like a lot of censorship against um, the speech of Palestinian activists or even just ordinary Palestinians, um, people in diaspora who were using hashtags um, around the, the conflict. Um, I would note that, you know, what tends to happen is that when platforms are oftentimes caught off guard, then they do invest um, resources and, and, and, and people into remedying that situation, particularly when it causes a public relations crisis. Um, and so I saw just today, I believe that um, Twitter, for example, has just brought Hamle, which is a Palestinian digital rights organization, um, which has been doing a lot of the great documentation of um, you know, unjustifiable takedowns of Palestinian speech. They've brought that organization onto their trust and safety council. Um, as part of their broader, you know, human rights initiative. So I think that there is a lot of room, there, there is some room for optimism here in terms of when, when there are these instances when we see platforms failing to um, meet their obligations under, you know, business and human rights principles. After they come under quite a bit of pressure, and I think that's the role of civil society essentially is to provide that oversight um, of platforms in a way that may lead to better outcomes than when governments get involved, because we have the examples, you know, from from Turkey, from Russia, and from others, of how you know government regulation tends to uh, incentivize the the removal of not only illegal speech, but as we see even in democracies like the UK, um, of speech that could be deemed as harmful but not illegal. So, um, you know, it's a very complex balance to be played around essentially how can we, among, you know, people in civil society, play to um, almost, let's say, use the, the tensions between governments and, and platforms um, as a way to make it a race to the top and to, you know, at times where pressure, is, particularly in democracies around regulation, has led to better outcomes in terms of self-regulation, um, but then also insisting when there are these instances around, you know, encryption or data localization, or you know, undermining intermediary liability, where civil society can also be on the side of, of platforms when relevant. So you know, I think it's it's never just believing that platforms are are the best and always the best protectors of, of free expression, but I think rallying around certain building a coalition when appropriate in order to you know defend users to defend human rights on the platform and i think that you know we have started to see some progress um you know particularly around facebook that i think has been investing a lot in terms of creating the a human rights framework hiring uh, directors for human rights and a whole team that is devoted to that and then also mainstreaming these issues within their their public policy Okay, that sounded a bit more uh, hopeful, but we, uh, we're, we don't have much time. So if you have any questions or comments, but now I wanna ask uh, one uh, more painful question uh, to both Andre, Irina and Zainal. <laughs> so, so all of these are happening with, you know, what are platforms doing, what are our democracies? But uh, uh, my question is, do people care? Because uh, in Turkey, of course, there's a uh, huge generational differences for uh, younger people, what they call Generation Z. These are very important. But for some other people, when um, in you know in countries such as ours, where you know people are a bit more polarized or populism is in place, then uh, they can buy into these arguments. For example, uh, uh, one of you uh, said that you know, Germany is also doing it, or you know, um, or uh, you know these uh, platforms are you know the West is trying to undermine our country, whatever. And unfortunately, there's a um, a lot of people because watching state news and uh, <laughs> because the, uh, there's no free media are under the impression that, you know, the government might be right, they're protecting us. So uh, do users really care about uh, these restrictions? The majority of them, it's, it's a hard question. And I know there's generational differences, but. Uh, uh, it depends. Uh, the Kremlin introduced uh, the first system of internet filtering uh, eight, it's eight years ago, even in 2012, it's now nine years ago. And back then, uh, they started censoring internet very lazily, and they did not—they did not 
took down a lot of information back then. And it was very easy to circumvent this censorship. Back then, people told us that they, most of people uh, told us that they, that they did not pay attention to this censorship because there are so, so, many, so much information on the, net, on the internet. But situations has worsened since then. And like 200 people uh, now are under criminal investigations uh, because, uh, because, uh, because of their postings on social networks. And it's a it's huge number. So people who are involved in some kind of political activity or people who are active on social networks, they, they care. But 80% of population, I think, uh, and it's not depends on the age, they don't pay attention. It's also in Russia, we have a huge divide between Moscow, big cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, uh, cities uh, which, which is bigger than 1 million, which has a population bigger than 1 million people. And uh, it's, uh, this is a one story. These people, they are much more, um, uh, much more knowledgeable about what's going on on the net and they, and, and they, they pay attention to internet filtering. And people in Russian provinces who are just, uh, I, I, I say, uh, how to put it, not to be offensive to them, then most of them, they just don't pay attention what's going on. Because it does not, so far, it does not uh, interfere into their private life. I would add only one thing that sometimes the government help, helped us to mm -hmm. promote the need for uh, well, using VPNs and uh, circumvention tools, because sometimes they made really stupid mistakes. Uh, we spent lots of time trying to explain people why mm -hmm. we need to use VPNs, and they always say something like, well, we don't care. And one very perfect day, uh, the Russian government decided to ban Pornhub. And immediately, uh, our country uh, raised to the position number one in the number of users of Tor. Just happened in one day because all these people in all these offices, they just got it, but they cannot go to their beloved Pornhub. Uh, the government then canceled this, uh, this ban, but it was already uh, too late. Uh, with uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, we got the same problem. Uh, nobody paid attention in the country to face recognition system. Uh, and then we video got uh, video surveillance system. And uh, all of a sudden we got COVID and we got thousands of people find it because they were identified uh, breaking uh, the regulation. And um, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, they, they were find it on substantial terms. And all of a sudden people, ordinary people started talking about why we have so many face recognition cameras, why we have uh, such an intrusive system of social monitoring applications, why we are forced to install all these apps if we got contracted COVID and why they fine us and why they ask us to say, to take pictures of us at three in the morning and send it to some Russian censors to check that we are still at home. So sometimes we do these mistakes and it's actually, it's quite good for uh, say for the society. This is interesting because these security things, sorry, Zelal, I know you wanted to say a word as well, but uh, these security cameras, yes, they, uh, or, you know, downloading apps, they over time can work against you. Uh, and this was a discussion in, in Turkey when they started, uh, uh, you know, putting out all these cameras on the city called Modese. And, oh, you know, this is good for your security. And then after a while, you know, if you lose your wallet, then the camera didn't work. But if you were in Gezi protests, then they were easily identified and protest. And now people see this and they, uh, and actually, unfortunately, their real life examples can be very good teachers as well. So there's a, also that is about the, uh, also then uh, there's a comment about this, the fact that the wider audience does not care from Ena uh, Omera, which again, is very much related to ignorance. Uh, and there are, uh, Media and digital literacy could be one of the answers. Yes, of course, this is uh, again tied to media freedoms, where you know uh, people are watching this. I don't know, Ahaber, uh, this uh, state channel, Pervi Canal, and they they don't have this other. It's not even ignorance. It's just a, a different planet. I think meant mindfully uh, they are on. And also, Berivan Oruchol asked another question. Uh, as again, about the the platform, is there anything that the international community can do to help beyond statements? And okay, <laughs> this we don't know, but uh, or could they pressure social media companies, etc.? Et yes, uh, Adrian, maybe you could uh, tackle this question. Can 
can social media companies be, I don't know, uh, be affected by the international community in any way? Well, I think we're already seeing that. You know, I think that the, the, the policies and practices of social media companies have changed a lot over the past 10 years um, and over the past five years and a few years. It, so pressure always does help. Um, I think at the same time, you know, let's say that uh, democracies particularly should be helping and, and, you know, supporting social media companies when it's relevant. So when social media companies are coming under attack from the Russian government, from the Turkish government, from the Indian government, you know, um, seeing it as in a, an interest of human rights for these governments to be actually applying pressure on those governments not to be passing laws that restrict freedom of expression um, or pass you know, greater data collection and surveillance. And I think it's also interesting to, you know, it's important to remember that even within governments, there are different um, departments. And so you know, the, it's, it's not accurate to say that because the United States government is um, you know, on the one hand through the intelligence agencies seeking to spy on virtually everybody in the world, but there are also, you know, departments within the United States government that are trying to do the opposite. They're trying to um, protect a free and open internet to protect internet freedom. And so I think that there are ways that we can be building coalitions among, you know, among certain governments or among certain, you know, policymakers and people within government and social media companies and, and civil society in order to be pushing back against some of these laws so that um, social media companies in the end aren't just then, I think the alternative scenario is that we're, we might live in a world where um, basically international social media companies are blocked in almost every country. And instead each country has its own local social media company that instead complies very much more closely with the local government. Yes, I think that seems to be happening in, in some other places and Turkey is also attempting. So I wanna go back to Zelal with that other question because I'm also not sure. And this is something can, we can discuss. Do people in Turkey care about these restrictions? Uh, what do you think? Yes. Um, actually, uh, I think um, the internet access is, uh, uh, has an important role, especially in these times in Turkey, after the Sedat Peker uh, videos, <laughs> uh, which is a mafia leader uh, exposing the illegal actions of the government. And um, after the sharing, uh, his videos became a popular figure in Turkey. This is just not about um, his words or his personality. Uh, this is also about to get information about the government actions. And then I think uh, besides of the security cameras, internet restrictions or uh, access ban decisions, we forgot something uh, because social media uh, and freedom of the internet is not only important for the following uh, the news or um, anything else because of course it's also very important for socializing or get connected especially in covid times uh, because of that people really care about the internet freedoms and any restriction against these freedoms yeah, uh, well, uh, yes, maybe there's a, a tiny bit of difference in, uh, in terms of users in Turkey and Russia, and especially of this, uh, this mafia leader that, uh, you know, we're <laughs> a, a proud moment for Turkey where we have, you know, given the world this uh, term deep state. Uh, and, uh, and now its ex-members are talking about the government and uh, he became a phenomenon. Millions of uh, mm -hmm. uh, YouTube videos, like a single video is uh, watched uh, three million times within the first 10 minutes. So... <laughs> So yes, it's crazy, and it's uh, and he always addresses young gender. He always says, "I'm talking to people under 40, right?" Uh, although he's of course a murderous uh, 
I don't know, <laughs> mafia leader. But uh, so it's, uh, I think, time for us to wrap up because uh, I'm being told that we're running out of time. And then uh, these are these meetings are back to back. Uh, but thank you very much, all of you, for uh, sharing your views. And it's, it was very interesting. And Andre, Irina, great uh, to have you guys here today. And thank you for, um, yeah, we're always following you. Uh, and also Zelal for uh, everything and Adrian, your guys' reports also. These are also, you know, very important for us because with all the data and analysis, we can also get a better view of, you know, how these things are evolving, be it in popular, uh, populist or democratic governments or whatever, and what we can do. And uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thank, uh, thank you uh, very much for your time and, and sharing your valuable insights. And I think we're out of time. Or if not, if you want to add anything, I think we have like 30 seconds left. <laughs> no, just thank you. Thank you for having us yeah, here. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to the audience for their contributions and questions.